thank you for the opportunity to come for me to be here and pretend that I understand quantum physics. I really don't, but <laughs> I believe I have a slight leg up than you guys. Okay? So, uh, in our brief talk, we're going to cover a quick refresher on quantum computing and a little bit about uh, cryptography. Um, and we're trying to get them to merge together and going to see, is there a real threat from quantum computing on existing encryption methods? Um, and then we're going to try and assess that threat. Is that real? Um, should we be wor worried? If, if yes, what should we be doing? Um, and hopefully towards the end we'll get into some recommendations and help dispel some uh, common myths about it. Cool? Um, great. So we'll start with the refreshing quantum computing. Uh, so quantum computing is based on quantum physics. Uh, it's a relatively newer concept, uh, you know, most more popularized by Richard Feynman back in uh, the early 1980s, but it really got into its own um, in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Um, so what is quantum computing? Imagine a coin. Um, when the coin could either have a heads or a tails, think of that as a bit one or a bit zero. And that's what we use in classical computers to do pretty much all of calculations. But a quantum, quantum physics bit, you could call it a qubit, um, is technically sort of spinning all the time. There is no heads or tails, so it's basically both heads and tails at the same time. Um, so that is called superposition. So you can think of the coin really just spinning forever, like inception. It's just not falling down ever. All right. Second, um, the other sort of concept or the uh, the physical phenomena is called entanglement, and we have two qubits or two spinning coins. Um, that are sort of related to each other. They can be linked to one another. They could be in two states. Um, this could be bit up, up, bit up and down, down, up. It could be one and zero. So basically we're trying to say you can sort of can create an, an, an array of qubits to represent several states at the same time. Because remember, all of these coins are spinning all the time. So these two bits could be all four of these positions at the same time. Now that's entanglement. Now this is real. I'm not making this up. Um, <laughs> Scientists have <laughs> measured entanglement up to a distance of, uh, from the Earth's surface all the way up to the atmosphere. So there was a satellite who, that, was, that had one photon that was entangled with a photon that was on the ground. So this is real, it happens. The, the other piece is, uh, as soon as you sort of touch a coin, it's going to fall down. And that's when it reveals one side. So it could either be bit one or bit zero. Now it'll stop behaving like a qubit and it'll basically become like a normal bit. Um, and the other piece, because of that fact, is that if somebody is trying to eavesdrop on this qubit and trying to figure out what it is, as soon as you touch it, because you kind of have to see it, if to see it you have to touch it, as soon as it touches, it falls down, it loses all of its inherent information and its entanglement, and then it becomes two traditional bits. So in digital computing, if you have two qubits, you ca you're you kind of safe from people trying to eavesdrop, because as soon as they do that, they've lost all the actual information that was contained in the qubits. That was pretty easy. <laughs> All right. Now, what does that mean for us? Quantum computers are currently extremely expensive. We're talking two to three hundred million dollars per device. I, I can say device. Um, I should actually just call it a building because they're massive. <laughs> um, remember ENIAC and UNIVAC back in the, uh, in the 60s and 50s? We're talking massive buildings. They are fragile. Um, if you go back here, Remember, as soon as we touch a qubit, it dissolves in a way, it stops being a qubit. Well, that fragility can come if there's a noise. If somebody speaks in a room, it's gone. If there's a mild earthquake in the area, and I'm talking Richter scale one, it's gone. If there's a temperature fluctuation, it's gone. Talking about temperature, it has to operate at colder than space temperatures. We're talking less than a Kelvin. So, you know, Hanover is pretty warm. Um, <laughs> and they're super, super error prone. Um, right now, we're talking 0.01%. Current processes that we use in our phones, they're in the orders of 10 raised to minus 9. So we're a long way ahead, a wrong way from an actual quantum computer. So really, when we're talking about a reliable, universal quantum computer in reality, we're kind of 10 years away from it. Now, the other, and I guess this is the last sort of problem with quantum computing, as if there weren't enough. Um, you don't get half a nuclear explosion, explosion if, you don't, if you're below the critical mass, which basically means you can't build a slow quantum computer. You can't build a not so great quantum computer. You either have it or you don't. It has to meet all of these sort of threshold barriers in order to operate, and as soon as it does that, it becomes the fastest. Now, now we're going to talk about the other piece, which is the cryptography. This one's hopefully a little bit simpler. Um, public key cryptography is the most popular sort of 
uh, buzzword, I guess, in cryptography. Um, it's easy to create and it's really hard to decipher and that's why it's so popular today. It runs most of our browsers, most um, online transactions, most sort of um, you know, signatures and all that. Um, and it really just works in a simple way. We have a plain text. This could be a file, an image, it could be anything. It could be your email. Uh, it's encrypted with a public key. Everybody knows this key. But to decipher it back to plain text, you need a private key. Now these two sort of combination of keys could be numbers, it could be anything at all. Um, and this whole concept of public key cryptography works on the fact that if you have a public key, it is nearly impossible to get the actual private key to decipher it. 99% um, of public key cryptography works on three popular protocols. You, you will call them RSA, Diffie-Hellman, and ECC, which stands for Elliptical uh, Curve Cryptography. Now, RSA, uh, this is probably, probably the most famous of them all, uh, founded by Mr. R, Mr. S, Mr. A, three scientists. Um, uh, they're, um, they worked on the fact that these, these, sort of th these two keys, um, if they are prime numbers, um, and then they multiply and become a really large number, it's almost impossible to um, factor a large number into its primes. So you can, think of, uh, you can think of the number 15, it has two primes, 3 and 5. 3 into 5 is 15, now that's easy. But if I'm talking a 10-digit number or even a 20-digit number, it's almost impossible for a, a classical computer to do it in a relatively um, acceptable time period. So, Two scientists came out um, to try and uh, sort of you know break this myth and um, help the decryption along its way. First one was Mr. Love Grover. He created an algorithm which reduces the time it takes to sort of search um, a long list and find a an entry. Um, and he he thought that maybe if you have all the private keys and you can really search through which private key is the best instead of figuring out which one is the one that works for you, um, he created one algorithm. But it was pretty easily um, you know, sort of overcome when you simply just increase the length of the number that you're talking about. So a bigger number makes Grover as Grover's algorithm basically, you know, the same. But the other one which really shook the world was by Peter Schor. Um, Peter Schor, um, at the time at Bell Labs, created the algorithm called Schor's algorithm. It works basically only on a Kona computer, but the real powerful sort of, uh, I guess, the whole notion of his algorithm, which is stated, I guess, best in this way. If you have a 2048 RSA bit key, uh, it would take three raised to ten, three into ten raised to eight years by a classical computer to figure out its private key. But with Shor's algorithm, with a quantum computer, you could do that in 36 minutes. So we're talking pretty much all, every single cryptography method out there could be broken if you have a quantum computer that could implement the Shor's algorithm. Now this was back in 1993. Nobody really cared about it. Everybody said, that's a great algorithm, Mr. Shore, but we don't have quantum computers, so thank you very much. Um, but in 2001, IBM said, guess what? We've created a computer that could implement it. And they did it with the number of 15, so they were able to get 3 and 5 with a quantum computer. And that sort of spurred uh, interest amongst everybody and said, whoa, is this real? Can we actually do this? And that's when uh, you know, funding sort of uh, poured in and everybody started getting excited about it. Um, now, if we take a threat assessment of the two more most popular protocols that people use today, RSA and ECC, um, RSA um, is relatively high uh, vulnerability to classical computers. Uh, it's, been, oh, it's been existing longer, people have better ways to break it. ECC is their newer one, um, which has lower vulnerability. It also is a smaller bit, so it's much easier for uh, browsers to do it, much smaller data to transfer. Now, because of that fact, everybody's trying to shift over from RSA to ECC because it's better, uh, less vulnerable to classical computers, but ECC is much more vulnerable to quantum computing. And that, uh, that, that drove the NSA and the NIST, which is the, national, you know, the government institute basically behind creating these standards for the, com for the world. Uh, that made them take notice and, th and they said, I think we really got to have a new standard uh, that could basically leap over the quantum computers even when they come and hopefully we'll be a post quantum computing state, we'll be in quantum computer safe era. Um, so here's the irony, right? So we have encryption standards, um, they are threatened by a quantum computer, but the quantum computer is nowhere to realization. Why do we even care about it? Why do we even new, need new standards? Well now's the time to bring in Nicolas Cage. It's because of bad actors. 
<laughs> because bad actors, they could be state, they could be non-state actors. Um, if they could create a quantum computer in the next 10 years, then we need to have a standard that fixes it. Um, it may not be implemented tomorrow, it may not be needed tomorrow, but maybe in the 10 years you need one. So instead of going from ECC to ECC2 and in better standards, it's better to just make the leap all the way. Um, so recommendations for CTOs. Um, one, you need to review your current encryption standards. You may be following the right standards, but your partners may not be. Um, the other is you need to figure out what's the benefit and cost analysis of doubling your key sizes. Those are the easiest ways to improve standards. Most browsers and most protocols already support larger key sizes, but you really need to understand what's the benefit and cost of doing it. Third, you want to stay updated with NIST because that's the sort of authority in this world on standards in general. Uh, you also want to get stay updated with PQ Crypto, that's the European counterpart, um, and they're both doing research together. And the last bit is you want to over communicate to dispel myths. Um, I was speaking to some experts at Dell EMC who are working on this, they're writing a book about it. They hold, um, they hold conferences within the company to executives who know quantum computers. It's pop science, oh my god, it's coming, is it going to wreck my business? Um, and they hold these conversations and they basically try and communicate the fact that this is the truth. In the next five years, it's not going to happen, but you want to be aware of it. So try and over communicate. Um, and yeah, just to end, quick, you know, common myths. Is a quantum computer faster than a classical computer? Not necessarily. It's faster when it's implementing the Shor's algorithm, but it's not faster when you're trying to browse the internet. It's not faster to do Facebook, okay? Um, there are news that companies are already creating it. D-Wave is the biggest name in there. Google's already created a quantum computer. And what does that mean? Well, they haven't really created a universal computer. They may have created annealers, which are basically computers that can do just one job. Um, think of calculators. They can only calculate, but they can't browse the internet. Um, and what's the real barrier to the universal quantum computer? We already talked about that. It's basically increasing the error or the fault tolerance. Uh, we're nowhere close to acceptable fault tolerance levels. And that is all. Thank you. <laughs> I will take questions as soon as we've read the comic. It's <laughs> so way back in 1997 when people were scared about <laughs> quantum entanglement and superposition. Is it going to blow up the world? It's almost like creating a black hole in a way. <laughs> but in a lab, it's safe. <laughs> No questions of quantum physics. <laughs> yeah. Um, so with quantum computing, what are some of the other use cases outside of uh, attacking the current encryption? Uh, like what are the other yeah. things can we do? Yeah, good question. Um, so there are companies that are taking up um, quantum computers to model DNAs. They're trying to model mo uh, various molecules because you really don't think of molecules also as like, you know, made up of atoms and nucleus. and you really don't have that figured out yet. I mean, you can't see it, so you're really trying to model those with a quantum computer and they can sort of do models in a much better way. So that's one, one option as well. And some biotech companies are investing their money, like Amgen is doing it, so. Yes? So first of all, that <laughs> explanation of what quantum computing is was excellent. Okay. I've watched your YouTube videos and I think you did a better job. All right. Um, Thank you. And, uh, but my question is, once, if, if a universal quantum computer were to be created, yeah. what, do you believe that it would have the potential to come up with some new sort of cryptography uh, standard, encryption standard, that would uh, be then quantum computing proof? Like, do you understand the question? I think? No. So is it what sort of standards are we looking at? No. Um, so to me, it seems like what we're trying to do is creating encryption standards for classical computers that would be uh, foolproof against quantum computers. Yes. If we were to create a universal quantum computer, right. would we then be able to quickly generate new encryption standards which would be quantum computing proof? Have you uh, yeah. Um, there are standards that already use quantum computing in itself. Um, there are standards that use the quantum computing bits to sort of quantum encrypt in a way, and that's already existing. I guess when there is a, a post-quantum safe algorithm already out there, I guess I don't really think that quantum computers are going to be used the way that we use classical computers in the first place. Mm -hmm. Even if it does realize itself in 10 years, 
we're not going to be needing standards. We're not, we're not going to be exchanging information over the internet for that. Uh, it's probably going to be in labs with universities, with large companies, NASA probably, stuff like that. So the need for a public key cryptography method is probably less warranted from a quantum computer perspective as opposed to a classical computer. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe we do need encryption standards, but not for a computer itself, I guess. I guess because you know, they can use it to break it, but does a computer itself use it? Probably not. So you said, um, so R there are two current methodologies, which is RSA and ECC. Yep. And people are moving from RSA to ECC, which is more. Yes. Which is Unsuccessfully. Right? Yes. But in that sense, how much, how hard to change one mechanism to another? No, oh, very. Um, what would be the cost associated so that, that you mentioned that like CTU should assess the cost elements? Right. So what, what would be that? Um, so I think it's shifting from RSA to ECC is a big challenge and it's, it has not happened the way we expect. I guess it's just the way that the internet world has reacted to encryption standards. It's happened before. Um, people have not shifted out of MD5 still. Uh, MD5 is long broken. Um, SHA is long broken. I mean, one is. I mean, three is out there, but people just somehow are not, are, I guess, reluctant in a way to switch to new standards because um, it could be because of lack of expertise. It could be uh, a lot of hardware works together to make things happen. And if one hardware is not up to one standard, the other one has to be sort of work together. So that's one. I guess the easiest is going from RSA 2048 to RSA 4096. Some stuff like that is much easier to do versus RSA to ECC. Yeah. OK. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you.